All right, let's pray. Lord God, I just thank you so much for John and Evelyn and for the heart that they have for people um, and for the Indigenous here in Canada. And we just thank you for how you have called them, as we heard on Friday with the youth, how you began at, as they were young to start pulling their hearts toward um, this this field, Lord, and we thank you for the blessings that they have been to us this weekend and to the blessings that they are to so many throughout Canada. And we just pray that you would use them as your instruments today as they speak and share um, your heart. In your name I pray, amen. Evelyn talks, I just want to say, it's quite emotional for me. This missionary, she grew up here from younger than you, because she was two, two years old, two, until she was 16, like Colton. All those years, this is where she learned how to be a missionary. Thank you, Sunday school teachers, for building into her. And youth group leaders, and Pastor Steves, and others. Thank you, Evelyn. So it's good to be good to be back. Um, I really enjoyed yesterday and all the I don't know fun pulling weeds <laughs> and um, but seeing everybody busy as bees all over the place that was so neat to see and um, and even the youth thing on Friday night that was ne neat to meet you your youth and um, you got a neat neat group of young people here um, as John said I grew up here uh, for well grade well when, since I was from two to age 16 and then we moved away but for somehow, somehow, I don't know, it seems like of all my siblings, um, maybe these, for me, these were the most, um, I don't know, memorable years, I guess. I don't know. Um, yeah, for me. Anyway, so lots of memories and um, lots of people that built into my life as I was growing up. Um, just as I look over the audience and I see Marge, she babysat me sometimes. And um, just neighbors and then... Dave and Marilyn, youth group leaders. Um, Steve spoke sometimes in the church. And then there was, oh, I don't know, all kinds of other ones. The Jack and Isla Steves. Um, Isla used to sing with my mother, I think, when they would, there were special numbers sometimes. And um, yeah, just all the memories come back. I'm just very thankful. And I'm very thankful for each one of you that, that pray for us and that, um, and that give. Um, we really, really appreciate it. Um, it doesn't go, it, it's not just a nothing. It's, it's, we've, we're very, very blessed. We thank you. So, um, I'm just, I'm just going to give a little, up, um, overview of what we do. So our title is field mission, field ministry coordinators. So we, we, um, basically supervising the field missionaries in the mission. And it's, um, so it's not the departments, it's not headquarters, it's not the Bible camps, it's not the print shop or the airport or tribal trails, but it's the missionaries that are out in the, in the different communities all across Canada. Um, we were supervising all across Canada until this past November. Um, they, they gave the eastern field, the, the maritime field missionaries to a different couple to look after, so we won't have to go there anymore. That's just basically the, the Maritimes and Labrador. We still go to northern Quebec and, um, and everything west of there, except for the new missionaries. The new missionaries that are coming on, um, for the most part, they're going under a different couple as well. So there's basically three of us couples doing it, but, but we have the bigger, the bulk of it. Um, so... Um, we look after the full-time missionaries, that's our priority, and then there's some part-time ones, there's some associate, there's some retired ones that are still going to the villages, like the, the communities, uh, as if they were full-time, almost, um, that are just, they can't, they've got it in their hearts, and so they just keep on going and going, and so we still supervise them as well, and 
Um, basically, supervising is the main thing, but our biggest focus has been to encourage them because most of those missionaries, they're, they're, they don't need any prodding or pushing or anything. Um, it's, it's the encouragement that they need mo the most. But um, So I just wanted to describe a little bit here. We, v we visit them in person once a year. And, um, and then we try to connect a second time at the conference. So some years there's field conferences, so three different conferences across the country, and we'll tr we have to go to each conference to connect with the missionaries a second time. Um, and then other years, like this year, it's a big general conference, so they're all coming together for the conference. We try to make a point of connecting with each of them while we're at the conference there. So um, just touching base with them to see how they're doing. So when we go to the vi visit them in their communities, we, are, we seek to get to know them personally, who they are, their giftings, their personalities, um, their past, their future, the struggles that they're going through. Sometimes there's family struggles, sometimes um, spiritual struggles. And um, so getting to know them and, and then getting to know their community. So whether it's a very open community or a closed community, how much traditional stuff is there, how much, how much past, is there a Christian past? Like sometimes there's been missionaries there in the past and so they're building upon another's foundation and keeping on going. Sometimes there's a church in the community and so they are um, more like a pastor to that group of believers and we seek to encourage them in that. Um, um, one of the things, okay, so, obs and observing their family life, their marriage. So we generally try to stay there for two days um, and three nights, depending on who it is, depending how long they want us. If they don't want us that long, we don't stay that long. <laughs> we try to cram it all into a few hours or something over a meal in a restaurant if we can, if we have to. But, um, but generally, the, the further away ones want us to stay. One, the one in northern Quebec, she wants us to stay there a week. <laughs> and, so, and so we do, because she hardly gets any company, any visitors. And so this is, uh, it's a highlight for her when we come. And um, so we observe their life. And if there's any struggles that we see happening, then sometimes we need to address things like, what about this? We notice this. What about that? Um, and then um, observing how they relate to the people in the community. When people stop in to visit them, how do they, how do they handle How do they respond? Um, how does the missionary respond? How do the people respond to the missionary? Just observing those things and, and um, being aware of what's happening and speaking into their life if they need it. Um, Mostly, it, it, they need just encouragement. Um, and then their ministry, different ones. God has, uh, like, when we went out as missionaries, especially years ago, the, our director really encouraged us, just pray to the Lord and ask the Lord for what he would have you do. Because every community is different and every individual missionary is different. So just because Joe Blow over here is doing Bible studies and prayer meetings and Sunday school doesn't mean you have to do that over in this community. What does God want you to do in this community? So there's a variety of things that they're doing. Some are involved in, um, like I said, church ministry. Others are um, like radio ministry. Some are ministering to prisoners. As they get out of prison, then they work with them, help them integrate into the community, help them find jobs. And some of them are doing ministry in the, right in the prisons. Um, some are, they have family camps or they will do kids clubs. Some of them, um, one guy started, especially during COVID, he started, he, th look, he was looking for opportunities to try and get together with the people. And so he, he, uh, checked on the website for the city of Prince Albert to see who had, who was dying, <laughs> who had died. <laughs> and he was able to connect with some people that way and get into the communities because he knew some of the ones who had passed away. So he would go to the funeral and with the First Nations people, usually they have like a two day wake. So it's lots of time to visit with the people and come alongside them and, and um, just share in their lives. And so, and then they would, because he was there, they were like, oh, can you play the guitar? Can you sing for us? And, and then he would get to share the word and it just, it opened up opportunities. I thought that was a neat thing that God put on his mind. And most of all, it's visiting in the communities, visiting with the people, being there, coming alongside them in their hours of need and in their hurts and in their joys. And um, just 
just seeing whatever way that, that they can they can be with the people. That's our biggest encouragement. And then ad, an uh, administrative wise, um, we do their job descriptions. Basically, we ask them, what has God put on your heart for you to do in this community? And they'll tell us, well, we think we, would, we feel we need to do this or that we should be doing that. It's okay. So we write it down in their job description. And then sometimes we'll add a little extra thing, you know, like maybe there's no visitation that they're wanting to do. And we're saying, mm, you should be being out with the people more, like go to their home, visit them and stuff like that. And so we kind of add a little bit here and there. Um, the main thing, one of the main things is their walk with the Lord. We really put it in their description, job description to spend time with the Lord and, and seek the Lord every day and also taking time for the family, not to, not to neglect family. Um, another, um, basically a lot of, I should have put it a lot, but some of the times it's answer, our ministry is answering questions and helping them figure out their way through. Sometimes there's issues that come up in the community or with, um, in their relationships with people and helping them work their way through it, asking questions and helping them to see things maybe from a different perspective and, and working through issues. Um, so that's basically, did I skip anything else? It involves lots of travel. And um, the interesting thing is God has given us an enjoyment of travel. <laughs> Believe it or not, but it's, uh, I always feel like over every hill and around every curve is another beautiful view that God has made, and we're thankful that we get to enjoy it. But mostly we're enjoying the people, the missionaries. The last church I spoke at had a pulpit like this. But if I turned it around, it was perfect for projecting on there. And so they just left it like that. And they took one of these and put it here for whoever had to MC and so on. So I had two pulpits. And I said, I was given 30 minutes. So I'll take 30 on each pulpit. <laughs> you didn't give me, well, you gave me three. <laughs> 30, 30, 90. That's not bad, but that's not even close to what the native people do. One time I was asked to speak at a remote flying community in northern Ontario, and it was um, their 43rd, I think, annual church conference. Isn't that incredible? My own church didn't even have that. I don't know if you guys have had, but we were there, and when I got there, I was, as I was flying there, I noticed a guy in front of me on the airplane reading the Bible. I thought, boy, he looks like he's preparing. I wonder if he's a speaker too. They had two of us on every session. You, you think you got it bad with me? <laughs> Service was to start at 7. I think I got put on maybe around 11 p.m. And it wasn't nice like this. It was in one of these big tents where the mosquitoes eat you alive. <laughs> so, you guys, please be patient with me. Um, I wanted to get this ready. <clears throat> so I'm going to be speaking about something. That's kind of an unusual topic, but it's one that God has put on my heart for this morning, and it's that God is sovereign. So there it is. I used to teach in Bible school for 18 years, so I like to write. I like to have object lessons, and where did my fireman's thing go that I brought into church this morning? Where's my big orange squirter? It disappeared on me. What if we have a fire? No. <laughs> um, before I start, I just want to say a couple of things. 
I'm just trying to get set up here. The first thing I want to do is to thank you. Thank you for letting us come and share. It's been a while since we've been in your church, which is Evelyn's home church. And I wanted to say to the Sunday school teachers and youth leaders, think of your, the people you're teaching as future missionaries and Sunday school teachers and pastors. Because that's where it comes from, is from the younger generation, right? Because we're going to die. I already have no teeth of my own. I have trifocals. I need a hearing aid instead of this. <laughs> and I have a broken ischium bone. That's the bone that touches the chair when you sit. That's why I always have a, that cushion with me. It's not that I'm just a pansy. I need that to sit or I'm in great pain. Um, oh, thank you. You can just set it here. <clears throat> so I wanted to thank you for that. Thank you for letting us come. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for supporting us. So I'm going to give you two. Um, I always taught my students, whenever you're going to give a suggestion to your, to your class, always give them two compliments first. So there are your two compliments. Thank you for the, all those things. And here's the one suggestion. When I was a kid, and I see a kid here, when I was a kid in church, and there would be a prayer letter come from a missionary that our church supported, and we were a tiny church, maybe a quarter the size of this, and we supported two missionary families in a different continent. And if a letter came in from one of those two families that the church supported, whenever that letter came in, he would stand right here, and he would open the letter, and would read the whole thing to us. That's how important missions was in my church. The pastor would let any evangelical missionary come in from any missionary from any country, and so we heard lots about missions. But that really spoke to me. I was so young, like these kids, the pastor would open, or the Sunday school superintendent would open that letter, and he said, I got a letter from the foreign fields, but in my kid's mind, I heard cornfields. And I thought, why is he opening another letter from the cornfields? I grew up on a farm, and we had no cornfields, so I couldn't relate to a cornfield whatsoever. But the mission part resonated with me. And from our tiny church, at least seven went into full-time ministry. Could they support seven? No. But God could, and he did. So I just wanted to say that by way of introduction. When I think of fire, our place, we were very concerned that it would burn down. Really concerned. We evacuated twice. And, and the second time when we were leaving, we said to each other as we're driving out the driveway, we don't know if we'll ever see this place again. And we don't have fire insurance. We couldn't find a company that would take us on. And so we knew if we burn, it's all gone. And I'm turning 68 this summer, so I'm running out of runway with my broken conditions. I can't really rebuild at this late stage in my life. When I was, we evacuated, I had to go speak in Evelyn's church that Sunday up there. Uh, by that I mean the church she moved to from here to there. And then we went to speak at our missionary candidate training 10 hours east at our Bible camp in Saskatchewan. And on the way back, I stopped at Lloyd Minster and I checked all the fire stores, and only one had any left of these. And I bought three. Edmonton was sold out. And then I went and I fought fire with this one right here. Not on our farm, but south, about four miles south of us, where there was still fire burning. And God saved us, and we're thankful. When I think of the concern an earthly fire gives, think of hellfire. Nothing can put it out. And it burns forever and forever and forever. And it says where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth 
and outer darkness, like this, and you're burning and burning and burning, and it's dark, and you can't see anyone. Not like Lazarus, who could see Abraham afar off and speak to him and say, could you bring me a drop of water on my tongue in the book of Luke? This helps motivate me for missions. Knowing of hellfire which cannot be quenched. And people are going to go there unless they repent and believe. Just think about that. This. Jesus is this in regards to hellfire. He is the one that can put it out for any individual that will repent and believe. And he's going to prepare a place for them. Now for the message today. So you can start timing me now. <clears throat> My mom and dad were born in Russia. And so the topic, God is sovereign is really important to me because my mom and dad grew up under tyrants. Recently, I became aware of these two books, Journeys, Mennonite Stories of Faith and Survival in Stalin's Russia. And it's just full and full and full of stories, maybe two, three pages each, how maybe one person would survive out of a whole family to tell the story of what happened. Maybe none survived. Mennonite martyrs is the other one. People who suffered for their faith in Russia. This book here starts from 1920. My dad got out in 1925. My mom in 1927, I believe. Mom was one of the last to get out. And I wanted to get one of these for each of my kids, thinking someday... That could happen here. And I have to think of what the Bible says of the sons of Issachar. They were in touch with the times. They were cognizant of what was happening and how Israel should respond. My question to you is, are you in touch with what is happening globally and what could happen to you and your children and your grandchildren? How are you preparing them in case you would lose all and they would too? Your kids, your grandkids. What if you had to walk away from your home and not have a penny for it, like not be able to sell? My grandpa on my mom's side only wanted to get out of from all the siblings. My grandpa on my dad's side, same thing, only one of all the siblings to get out. To me, it's very vivid, very real. So as I see our freedoms diminishing rapidly, and as I see the planning that's happening that you do not hear on mainstream media, but if you have an ear to hear, you will search it out, and you will find it, and you will be aware of it. The things that I was taught in high school and in university, those definitions have been changed about pandemic, about vaccination, about Im uh, immunity. Those things, they're not the same as when I studied in school. They've been switched. Things like losing our sovereignty. Right now, they've been drafting things for the next pandemic and that the nations will lose their sovereign control over their jurisdictions and it will be given over to the World Health Organization. And next year, they're going to do the final signing of it next year. Globalization, the World Economic Forum. Klaus Schwab, one of his main counselors, Noah Harari, an Israeli, but super far from God. Transhumanization, all these kinds of things that we read about. Digital currency, where they can just switch you off digitally if you don't agree with the dogma and just turn you off. Many times I go to the gas pumps and I wonder, when I go and I put in my card, which day will it be that it won't work for me? Because I don't agree. Just like my dad didn't agree with Stalin. If 
I'm not a prophet. Let me repeat that. I'm not a prophet. I'm not predicting what's going to happen or saying this will happen. I'm saying if it happens, are you preparing your children and your grandchildren? And are you willing to walk away and leave everything behind and be in prison or a torture camp or a labor camp, a slave labor camp, like many of my people tell of in these two books? It's not a fairy tale. If it happens to you, here's what, you can, here's what God can do. God can remove you. <clears throat> Maybe I'll put it in a different color, just so it stands out a bit. God can remove you. What are some Bible examples of that having happened? Noah. The days were extremely evil. All the imagination of the thoughts was evil continually. And God took Noah out. I'd like to preach an hour on this, but I'll, I won't say any more about Noah, even though I, I want to. Number two, Israel. So I'm moving chronologically through the Bible. So after Noah was Israel. And Israel was in Egypt. And God said that I took you out of Egypt. He says, I took you from Egypt. And he said that five times to them. Sometimes you say something three times to your kids. But listen to many times God said this to his kids. Out, of, out from Egypt five times. Out of Egypt 74 times. Out from the land of Egypt 81 times. I did my mass, and that's 160 times. He's telling them and telling them and telling them and telling them and telling them. He removed them from out from under Pharaoh. God can do that. He is sovereign, and he can do that if he wants to. He doesn't always do that. Here's another one. He removed my parents. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing here today. Another one, Joseph and Mary and the young child. He removed them from Israel all the way to Egypt. There's three examples from the Word of God, chronologically. Next one, God can remove the tyrant. What are some Bible examples of that? Goliath, standing nine feet tall. The best soldiers can't take him out. What does God do? He takes a lad, a teenager. God says, come here with what you got. Oh, you have a slingshot? Bring it. Might need that. Takes a stone. I always thought the stone killed him. But the Bible says the stone knocked him to the ground. And then David ran to him, took his sword, took the Goliath sword, and it says slew him with it. Cut his head off with that. A lad. God can do whatever to get rid of the tyrant. Think of the Syrians and King Sennacherib when he came with a myriad of soldiers and they prayed, God, God's people prayed and God sent an angel and he took out 186,000 overnight. Nobody had to lift a sword. Nobody. God just took 186 of them in the night and when the soldiers, when the enemy woke up, this many of their people were dead and that tyrant left. God removed them. They took off. God can do that. Oh, by the way, this is the triune God. One of the young people saw me before church and wondered about this. Well, this is God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's my shorthand for God. I wish I could have studied shorthand, but I didn't have that chance in school, so I just made my own. God removed Herod the baby killer. He told Joseph in a dream, now you can come back because I removed him. The tyrant's gone, you can come home. He doesn't always do that, but he did for Joseph and Mary and the young child. Third thing, God can give grace in suffering. Maybe God wants you to suffer. Many believers have suffered through, this, through history and are currently today. Let's go in, 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 uh, in the Bible. Let's start with Joseph in Genesis 37. 
He suffered at the hands of his brothers. You'd think his loved ones would stick up for him and encourage him, support him, but no, that's where he got, they were going to kill him, actually. Then he goes to Potiphar's house, and he suffers at the hand of Potiphar's wife. Then he gets put in jail, and he gets, suffers at the hand of the fellow prisoners. He gets forgotten for a number of years there. And then what does God do? God gave him grace in each of those things. God gave him favor in Egypt. And soon he's second in command. And God tells Joseph to tell this to his brothers. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. It says in chapter 50, to the saving of many alive. Not just the Israelites, but also the Egyptians. God wants us to be his fragrance to believers and unbelievers. Another one, the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> Elliot, can you bring your Bible up here? And can you turn to can you turn to 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23? 2 Corinthians eleven twenty-three. Oh, yeah. And can you just read, and I'll try and do fast shorthand. Uh, to 20, uh, 23 to 28. Look how much he suffered. Just take a note. Keep going. Okay, start off. Are they servants of Christ? I know I sound more like a madman, but I have served him far more. I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three just times. Wait, just wait. Three times with rods, and then, okay, one stone, okay, keep going. Three times with stones, one time with that. Three times. Five times. Uh, oh, boy. Five times. Five, to five different times there? Yeah. Okay, five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Yeah. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. Yeah. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. Keep going. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. So I'll just put their false believers. Okay, keep going. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. Keep going. I have been hungry and thirsty, and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Verse 28. Then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. Thank you. It's like Evelyn said, the care of the missionaries on top of different troubles this one I relate to the care of the churches or the care of the missionaries. We'll just put this for short. Did Paul have, what if he had just one of these? Look at his list. And he says in another place, he wrote about half the New Testament. In another place he says, but my grace is sufficient for thee. Is it sufficient for you? And you, Colton, and you, I don't know you, and pastor, and kids, it's sufficient for everybody. What if all the World Economic Forum stuff happens? It's not a secret. It's not a, cons it's not a conspiracy theory. It's real. They're telling it to you. Over and over, they're telling it all over the place. Here's some of the things they say. You will be happy and own nothing. How many of you have heard that? Any of you have heard that? A few have. You know what? 
the devil's stuff is a bunch of lies. The only place you'll be happy and own nothing is in heaven. If you own stuff here, you're always fixing it. Even yesterday, one guy said his bobcat, the door handle broke, and they're trying to figure out how to get it home. Right? It's always breaking here. We're in danger of burning or whatever, hey? Eh? But in heaven, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Because it's all about Christ there. All about Christ. <clears throat> There's many verses that I have to go along with in, but I don't have time. So we'll go to the last one. In the last one, God can take you home. Which means heaven. Which means like dying here, right? Let's just be blunt. Passing? What's that? Dying. Dying. Jesus died for me. Every one of you is going to die unless he rap raptures you, which could happen. He, mi he might rapture us. And I was thinking, okay, let's go back to the Bible. What, are, what does the Bible say? Well, Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, I believe it was, 6 or 7, it says, Stephen was a man full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. He's a spirit-filled, spirit-led man. He's the kind of guy you want on the board of your church, right? And what happens? They pick up stones. Whew. One would just hurt like crazy. And then another, and then another one comes, and then another one. And what comes out of him? Most men would revile and, I'm going to get you back, I'm going to kill you. No. What does he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He genuinely was filled with the Holy Ghost. And what does God say? I'm going to leave you here and you're going to do great works for me? No, he says, I want you home. It's hard to compute with our sense of reasoning, eh? And God says, I'm going to take you home. Maybe God will take you home. He has taken many home. My dad told me about a book called Fox's Book of Martyrs. And the original, if you ever buy it, try to get the original from Amazon, the unabridged original version, Fox's Book of Martyrs. You know what? They could come, and they can take your favorite pickup truck or the fiancé you're going to get married to next week or your family or your house or your job or whatever. But you know what they cannot do? I looked it up, some verses here. Fear not them which kill the body, Matthew 10, 28 but are not able to kill the soul. They can't take your salvation. Whoa, that's our God. That's our Savior, eh? Under the shelter of his wings. Luke 12, 2. Be not afraid of them which kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. God can do miracles if he wants to. He did all through the Bible. But if he wants to take you home, he can do that too. The Bible says, in this world you shall have much tribulation. And there's lots of verses that talk like that. Even Paul said, I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. One of the oldest men in our mission taught me this song. Time after time, I hear people say to me, Why don't we see miracles like there used to be? I still believe in miracles. God hears us when we pray. Because God was God back yesterday, and God is God today. God can do it again and again and again. He's the same God today as he always has been. Yesterday and forever, he's always the same. There's no reason to doubt God can do it again. Think of the songs that you are learning as a church. One thing I really like to do when I go and speak in Bible camps I teach them scripture put to music. If the Uyghur camps from China are set up here, and I'm, I would expect I'd be one of the first in there, you know the songs that will carry me? The songs that have depth. You ask God to meet your needs, so why not trust in him? 
God has done it all before he can do it all again. He's willing, much more willing than I could ever say to perform a mighty miracle in your life today. God can do it again and again and again. He's the same God today as he always has been. Yesterday and forever, he's always the same. There's no reason to doubt God can do it again. Remember, God is sovereign. I'd like to show you some pictures. Um, we'll just turn it on. And somebody can turn off the lights. And we'll move this so you can see. Boy, you got smart women in this church. They did soup, and soup doesn't burn. <laughs> Except for maybe bachelors. <laughs> I have many maladies physical in my life, and one of them is my nose goes. So I have a Kleenex in every vehicle and in every room of the house, and sometimes two per room. Oh, we should hook something up here. Cell phones can do anything, right? <laughs> Young people taught me this trick. So maybe even these lights could go off just so you can see the picture a little better. And we'll straighten this up. There. Let's look for Hoadley. Second from the left on the bottom there. There we go. So Evelyn was saying, in each job description, we ask the missionaries to be faithful in their walk with God and to spend time adequately with the Lord. That's their first priority. And <coughs> it's important that if we ask them to do it, we should be doing it too. And Evelyn is very faithful. This is the house that dad sawed the trees here, sawed the trees down, cut them into lumber, hauled